afternoon. It is Thursday, October 10th. I'm Yumna Naufel and these are today's headlines. Libyan Prime Minister Ali Zidane is freed hours after he was seized by former rebels, according to a spokesman of the foreign ministry. International weapons inspectors in Syria confirmed the visit to three sites, working on a tight schedule to destroy the chemical arms stockpile and program. And the United States suspends its aid to Egypt to signal a deep concern over the mounting bloodshed and the lack of a democratic transition. President Michel Sleiman is stressing that Lebanon merely demands the international community to share the burden created by the exodus of Syrian refugees and facilitate their return to their country. He pointed out that Lebanon called for the establishment of UN protected refugee camps inside neighboring country Syria to facilitate the return of the refugees. During a meeting for the International Support Group for Lebanon on September 25th, the international community and UN official praised the extreme generosity of Lebanon in keeping its borders open to refugees during the 30-month-old war. The attendees also reckoned that the country's sufferings from dramatic impact on its economy and its society by the influx of people coming in. The international meeting in New York announced 339 million U.S. dollars in additional humanitarian aid in response to the Syrian crisis, including 74 million for Lebanon to support the refugees. The military examining magistrate issued an arrest warrant against a dissident Syrian colonel for forming an armed gang to carry out terrorist activities. The warrant was issued after Judge Fadi Sawan interrogated the suspect, identified as Ahmad Amir, a Syrian army colonel who has defected. He referred him to the military prosecution to take the appropriate action. On Wednesday, the state commissioner to the military court, Judge Sa'ir Sa'ir, charged 12 people, including a Lebanese and two Syrians who are in custody, with plotting terrorist activities and planning assassinations. The three suspects were arrested by the General Security Department, but LBC said that Amir is not linked with the 12-member network. It said he also is seeking to recruit fighters to send them to Syria. A spokesman for the international weapons inspectors in Syria confirms they have visited three sites so far across the country, working on a tight schedule to destroy its chemical arms stockpile and program. The UN has tasked the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons to rid Syria of its stockpile by mid-2014, the tightest deadline ever given to the OPCW and the first conducted amid a civil war. 27 inspectors are meant to visit over 20 sites, at times having to cross rebel-held territory to reach some other ones. The UN hopes to organize ceasefires between rebels and government forces to ensure safe passage. In The Hague, OPCW spokesman Michael Luhan said the first series of sites on the inspectors' list are relatively securely within government-held territory. Libyan Prime Minister Ali Zidane has been freed hours after he was seized by former rebels, according to a spokesman of the foreign ministry. The pre-dawn seizure of Zaydan came five days after U.S. commandos embarrassed and angered Libya's government by the capture of a senior al-Qaeda suspect known as Abu Anas al-Libi, and he was captured off the streets of Tripoli. A former Libyan rebel group said on Thursday it had arrested Zaydan after the government allowed the United States to capture al-Libi. The Libyan Revolutionary Operations Chamber said on Facebook it had seized the Prime Minister on the prosecutor's orders, adding that Zaydan was arrested under the Libyan Penal Code on the instructions of the public prosecutor. Public anger is growing as widespread violence, including political assassinations, proliferates, particularly in the east of Libya. The United States has suspended deliveries of major military hardware and cash assistance to Egypt to signal deep concern over the mounting bloodshed and the lack of a democratic transition. Washington says it has stopped shipments of some large-scale military systems, as well as halting 260 million U.S. dollars in cash aid to Egyptian military leaders who are currently running the country after ousting its first democratically elected president. Although the U.S. review of its decades-old policy would not be permanent, it would remain in place pending credible progress, according to a State Department spokesman. Egyptian officials say a suicide bomber rammed his explosives laden card into a checkpoint outside a coastal city in volatile Sinai Peninsula, killing three soldiers and one policeman. 
Security officials say the attack happened on Thursday outside the city of Al Arish. They say the bomber slowly approached the checkpoint, waited for soldiers and policemen to start searching the car before he blew himself up and the vehicle as well. Five other people were wounded, and the official spoke on condition of anonymity in line with the regulations. Now, Islamic militants have been attacking security forces in Sinai for years, but the frequency of the attacks has dramatically grown since the ouster of Islamist President Mohammad Mursi in a July coup. The army and police are waging a campaign against the militants in northern Sinai. President Barack Obama confronts Republican leaders just one week before a talks' political stalemate could take an even more extreme turn and degenerate into a historic debt default crisis. House Republican chieftains, including Speaker John Boehner, will join Obama at the White House with neither side yet apparently ready to concede ground in a standoff over a government shutdown and raising America's borrowing authority. Various scenarios for an exit to the shutdown, including a short-term government funding bill and a temporary debt ceiling rise, are being floated in Washington, but have yet to develop into a workable exit strategy. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development on Wednesday said that a default could throw most of the world's major economies back into recession next year and badly damage emerging nations. Pakistan's Malala Yousafzai has won the European Parliament's Chakarov Prize, which honors freedom of thought. Parliament President Martin Schulz called the 16-year-old a brave advocate for education who reminds us of our duty toward children and especially girls. The prize is worth about $67,000. Malala was riding the bus home from a school a year ago when a Taliban gunman climbed aboard and shot her in the head. She nearly died, but since then, Malala recovered and has become a global activist for girls' education. Coming up next, the head of trade relations with Australia and Lebanon is in our studios. Mr. Michael Rizit, stay with us. There are over 450,000 Lebanese expatriates in Australia. The Lebanese presence in Australia has been achieved through three successive waves, the first from around 1880 to the 1920s, the second from 1947 to 1975, and the third from 1976, which marked the beginning of the civil war in Lebanon, to the present. The period following the civil war has seen a reduction in Lebanese migration to Australia and a significant rise in the number of short-term return visits to Lebanon. This reflects release of the pent-up demand for a return to this country after the civil war. Joining us now is the head of trade relations Australia and Lebanon in the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Michael Rizit. Michael, I wanted to ask you, I know you're also one of those individuals who enjoys coming back to Lebanon so much. Can you tell me why? I think it's very simple to, to say why. We're, we're, I have roots here. I am, uh, I am uh, of Lebanese origin. so. Uh, Lebanon to me means a great deal, just as much as Australia means a great deal to me. And I, I consider myself very lucky to be uh, in a position uh, of belonging to these two wonderful countries. So uh, really, to come back, come back to my roots, to my homeland. So it's, it's not a, uh, something that I regard as extraordinary, just I regard it as, as quite normal. The Australian-Lebanese relations, how would you describe them? I think we, uh, we have, uh, Australia and Lebanon have always had a, 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 an excellent relationship. And uh, the relationship, in fact, goes back to the, uh, the First and Second World Wars, where Australian soldiers were positioned in Lebanon. Uh, uh, the, uh, the situation took a dramatic turn in, uh, the, uh, during the Second World War, where a lot of Australian soldiers became uh, very good friends with a lot of Lebanese, and, and, uh, and the same, same thing from the Lebanese side. Let's, let's talk a bit about trade relations, because you're the head of the trade relations in the Australian-Lebanese Chamber, and I know you were here in order to work with the Chamber of Commerce in Beirut as well. Can you tell us about the work that you did with the Chamber of Commerce in Lebanon? Well, our, the, 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 our chamber in Sydney has a relationship with all the chambers uh, from uh, a fair while ago. In fact, our chamber 
was established uh, 28 years ago uh, at times in time where Lebanon was going through a lot of difficulties. Uh, so the, the relationship with the chambers have always been there, but I think this visit this year has strengthened that relationship between uh, our chamber and all the chambers in Lebanon, and, and that includes uh, Tripoli, uh, Saida, Zahle, and how, of course How Beirut. did it strengthen it? What, why do you say that? What strengthened it exactly? I think we've, we've set up uh, sort of committee uh, networks inside the chambers where we can have a follow-up. Uh, in the past, we used to come here and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, when Lebanon was going through a lot of turbulences, so the, the follow-up sort of didn't, didn't uh, take place as much as it should have been. But this time, I believe that the follow-up will produce results for the benefit of both Lebanon and Australia because of the, the team that, that is now uh, sort of taking uh, a playing a role in these uh, various chambers. I, I really appreciate the optimism because I know you tend to be very optimistic. However, there is a political crisis here. There is no government. There, there's also an economic crisis that people are talking about. So how do trade relations stand today? Uh, look, the, the, the Lebanese, I mean, uh, have always... I mean, go back to the, when the, the war first erupted in 75 in Lebanon and the way the, the Lebanese people dealt with it. I mean, they didn't sort of sit at home and waited for a government to be installed or a government to take action. Uh, so uh, the resilience of the Lebanese people have proved time and again that they are capable of uh, keeping their country on the ground, uh, keeping its, its feet on the ground. But it shouldn't stop there. I mean, it's, it's a joint effort between the people, the government, the leaders from all sides, whether the business sector or the political sector. Uh, everybody has a role. We all have a responsibility to keep Lebanon uh, uh, going. Uh, but the, the Lebanese individual have always uh, proved that they are capable of producing results. And that's the, clear, the, the evidence is very clear. All you have to, all you have to do is uh, see how the, Lebanon, the Lebanese perform here and abroad. So from that angle, I think you know, we, can, we can come up with a better future for our, uh, for our people uh, and for our country land. Michael, I want to end on this. I know you and I have sat down and talked before, and I remember what was really striking in our conversation was that you were talking about our produce and how eventually we're getting to the point where we'll be able to export Lebanese produce and I remember you were mentioning specifically the fruit and the taste of fruit that Lebanon's fruits have yes. and how an Australian person who tasted it was like this is very very different and this is better than anything I've ever had. Can you comment on that a little bit? Uh, that particular subject, Yumna, has been, uh, uh, you know, has been uh, on my agenda for quite a number of years. But I, I'm one of those people that do not give up easily. I believe that you know, we can penetrate the Australian market uh, because we can meet the, uh, the Aquis, or that's the Australian quarantine conditions. If we perform, uh, if we can uh, 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 sort of uh, address whatever issues we have uh, from the, uh, the fertilizer or the pesticide that we, we use in Lebanon. Uh, I believe that this time, uh, this particular subject is really on track because we have formed a committee between uh, the chambers, the Ministry of Agriculture and our chamber to pursue this matter seriously from both sides. So uh, communication is already in place what is required uh, to, uh, to, for Lebanon to do so the Australian uh, quarantine will accept uh, Australian fresh, uh, Lebanese fresh produce. And we plan to start with one particular produce, possibly grapes or cherries, and then follow up with other, with other perishables. Okay, well then we'll be having Lebanese cherries when we visit Sydney next time we come around. So thank You're you so welcome. much for being with us today. Thank that, you. That was the head of trade relations of Australia and Lebanon in the Australian Lebanese Chamber, Mr. Michael Rizit. On that note, let me remind you of today's headlines. Libyan Prime Minister Ali Zidane is freed hours after he is seized by former rebels, according to spokesmen of the Foreign Ministry.
National weapons inspectors in Syria confirm the visit to three sites working on a tight schedule to destroy their chemical arms stockpile and program. And the United States suspends its aid to Egypt to signal deep concern over the mounting bloodshed and the lack of a democratic transition. Those are your Thursday headlines live on Future Television. Serge Beberi is next with the French News. Live in Beirut, I'm Yuna Nofa. Good night.